Today's video is about an R&B singer who gained a cult following for her fervent, gospel-influenced style and tremendous vocal acrobatics. Despite the fact that her career was cut early at the age of 27, she is still cherished among soul fans today. Her initial success appeared to be the beginning of a long career that may rival Aretha Franklin, Gladys Knight, and Alma Thomas, or the title of the Queen of Soul. The topic of today's video is all about Miss Linda Jones. Before we get started in today's video, please be sure to leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel, and push that notification bell to be sure you won't miss out on any more uploads. Now without further ado, let's cue that intro. Linda Jones was born on December 14, 1944, in Newark, New Jersey. Growing up in a musical family, she was immersed in gospel music. Jones began singing in her family gospel group, the Jones Singers, at the age of six. The family performed in churches all around New Jersey. Jones' initial introduction into music was gospel. By her teenage years, Jones discovered another type of music this was secular. Joan's life was transformed when she heard R&B music for the first time. This was her epiphany. She understood exactly what she wanted to accomplish with her life, and that was to sing soul music. Jones devised a strategy after high school by working a series of dead-end jobs during the day and singing in tiny bars around Newark at night. While doing this day and night, she would catch the eye of an MGM Records A&R scout. Linda Jones, who was 19 at the time, grabbed the A&R Scout interest. Jones secured a deal with MGM's sub-dairy label, Cub Records, and recorded her debut single, a cover of Jackie Wilson's Lonely Teardrops. My heart is crying, crying, lonely teardrops. The label billed her as Linda Lane when she was with Cub. Despite the name modifications, the single failed to make an impression, and Jones' stint with MGM ended before it could begin. Despite the failures, Jones remained static and resumed her usual routine of working during the day and, and singing at nightclubs. While performing one night, Jones met Jerry Harris, who was a staff writer at Joe B. Teak Music, which was Motown's publishing company. Right away, Harris saw Jones' talent and assured her that he would assist her. Harris followed through on his promise and brought Jones to songwriter and producer George Kerr. Little to Jones' realization, this was the beginning of a six-year partnership. Kerr planned a recording session in a New York studio in October 1964, not long after their initial encounter. Jones recorded two singles during the first recording session with Take the Bad Out the Country, And I'm taking back my love. I gave my love to you. You took it. Her took these singles and shopped them around various labels. Executives at Atco really liked these songs and they were keen to sign a Jones. Despite the great quality of both songs, the singles flopped commercially, thereby ending her stint at Atco. Kerr was on a quest to have Jones' voice heard. And while he was sinking for labels, Jones resumed her club performances. Now around this time, serving at nightclubs and bars was equivalent to doing the musical apprenticeship. This allowed Jones to polish her art. Kerr brought Jones back to the studio and recorded two additional singles with Fugitive From Love, love. and you hit me like a TNT. He took these two tracks to Bluebird Records, who liked Jones so much that they decided to release them, but the singles failed to find the audience. He was determined to get Jones' voice heard, so he will book another recording session and Jones will record the song Hypnotize. After this song was recorded, 
His first trip was to Brunswick Records, but at the time they was not searching for any female musicians due to them already having Barbara Acklin, who they was extensively pushing. He would follow the advice of a Brunswick staff writer and went to Warner. When executives at Warner heard this song, they was blown away and signed her immediately to their sub-label, Loma Records. In May of 1967, Hypnotize was officially released. Jones eventually had her breakthrough moment after a hard pursuit and four failed singles. This became the beginning of something incredible. In September of that following year, she released the song, What I've Done to Make You Bad. Now these two singles was the most successful on the Loma record. The label will also debut her album that same year that peaked at number 26 on the Billboard R&B Albums charts. This album also had an unappreciated single with If Only We Had Met Sooner. I know you belong to someone. I knew this when I Things was on a high for Jones and the start of a journey. As 1967 came to an end, Jones released another single, Give My Love a Try. By 1969, Warner realized that they was making way more money in rock than soul music, so they would close Llama doors. Since the label closed, Warner moved Jones up and she would release a single, My Heart Will Understand. Whoa, 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 whoa. You say you... Which failed the chart and her time at Warner was over. Later in 1969, Kerr took Jones back to record two covers of the OJs, I'll Be Sweeter Tomorrow, I always like to be you. and That's When I Stop Loving You. When the bird's no longer. Kerr marketed these tracks to different companies before they were signed with Gamble and Huff label Neptune Records. Linda was transitioning from a large label to an independent label, so this was a kind of a, of a detour to her. By 1970, Jones was part of a package tour that toured all around America. At each concert, Jones would make three appearances, performing between three to five songs, including introducing her to a wider audience. Jones was diagnosed with diabetes at a very young age, and she, like many other diabetics, had to take medicine and keep a strict diet. Jones' body really began to suffer, particularly on tour, as a result of needing to manage what she ate as well as keeping her blood sugar levels reasonable. Sometimes while on these tours, Jones would suffer from a, from a diabetes attack. Eventually, they began to happen too often. This began to bother her, but she would continue to work. By 1971, Jones signed with Turbo Records and released the song, Stay With Me Forever. As 1971 came to an end and 1972 began, Jones released her second album called For Your Precious Love, which peaked at number 35 on the Billboard Top R&B Album Charts. Two singles will follow this album with Not On The Outside, In your precious love. precious love. As this album popularity grew, tragedy was strike. Jones performed twice at the Apollo Theater on March 13th, 1972. Jones' mother resided in Newark, so when she had a show in New York, she would come and visit her in between souls. Jones enjoyed a dinner with her mother on March 13th before heading for a nap before her second show. Her mother went in to check on her but was unable to wake her due to her falling into a diabetic coma. An ambulance was dispatched and she was brought to the hospital. Jones will sadly pass away the very next day on March 14, 1972 at the age of 27. On June 3, 2021, the Grammy Museum in Newark added artifacts of Jones to their New Jersey Legends exhibit. On December 14, 2021, 
City of Newark recognized Jones by renaming Sherman Avenue, where Jones grew up, to the Linda Jones Way. Her daughter, Terry Jones, Helen Brewer, George Kerr, and Freddie Jackson was among those in attendance. Linda Jones will be regarded for having one of the most beautiful and diverse vocals in soul music. If she had lived, I honestly believe she could have challenged Gladys Knight, Alma Thomas, and Aretha Franklin for the title of the Queen of Soul.